Hey everyone. Um, so, welcome to the second International Summer School of CRC, Refiguration of Space. Before we start, um, I want to inform you that um, there will be some photographs. And if you don't want to be photographed, please either talk to Kusai or Zoe, I think, or just Kusai, okay, <laughs> just Kusai, and let him know. So, yeah, here we are for the keynote event with two amazing researchers as a part of uh, International Summer School of CRC. For those of you who um, don't know what CRC is, it's a collaborative research center funded by German Research Foundation. At CRC, through um, 15 sub-projects, we are focusing on space, spatial figures and processes that are highly influential in uh, social world and social reality. Um, in this investigation, we are uh, mainly um, benefiting from the um, refiguration of space approach developed by Professor Martina Löw and Professor Hubert Knoblauch and many other researchers in TU Sociology and CRC. And the research center is mainly located at TU Sociology, but we also have um, many researchers internationally and in Germany. Uh, and it's also quite interdisciplinary. We have work. Uh, we are working with colleagues from um, urban planning, geography, architectures, anthropology, sociology, communication science, and and many more. So, if you're interested in what CRC does, uh, there is a counter in the entrance with our publications. You cannot buy them now, but you can uh, order online um, our publications. So as I said, this is the second international summer school organized by CRC, mainly by PhD um, researchers um, in the CRC. Uh, we started this morning with an excellent, very diverse program um, with reading, theoretical reading, and we will go on tomorrow and on Friday. Um, and this is the, the keynote uh, event that is being um, streaming. And there's another um, part of the summer school that is also being streamed, which is the activism talk with um, the activists from various spatial uh, struggles, uh, movements. Uh, and this is on Friday morning from 9 to 11, if you want to check out. Uh, it's going to be in, uh, at CRC building in uh, Ernst Reuter Platz. But as I said, you can also join online. Uh, and there's a lot of work went to this uh, summer school and this event, and it's organized by our brilliant, really hardworking colleagues. So I want you to join me to uh, give them some appreciation. Thank you, everyone, being involved in organizing this event. <laughs> I don't know if you want to show your face or want to stay anonymous, <laughs> okay? So, um, now we start with the keynote. Uh, we have two researchers, um, Dr. Nihat el Kayed and Professor Dr. Johanna Herning. I have some struggle with your last name, <laughs> but okay, I said it right, <laughs> fine, <laughs> great. Uh, we will first have 20 minutes um, speech um, from each and then the Q&A session is at the end. The people who are uh, online can also raise questions in the chat and we're going to read them out loud here. Uh, so yeah, we are starting with uh, Dr. Nihat al Kayed. Dr. Kayed is a research associate at uh, Berlin Institute for Empirical Integration and Migration Research at Humboldt University. She's leading the project urban, uh, from urban redevelopment to immigration uh, neighborhoods. Um, it is a sub-project of reduction of social boundaries and access uh, barriers in the neighborhood, funded by Federal Ministry of Education and Research. She acquired her BA at Heinrich Hein, uh, Heine, University of Düsseldorf, um, Social Science Department, and MA from Bielefeld Sociology. She completed her PhD dissertation titled Local Conditions of Democracy, the Relevance of Neighborhoods for Political Participation of First and Second Generation Immigrants. 
She has been working as a researcher and visiting researchers in many projects in many academic institutes. She's a member of the editorial collective Suburban and Zeitschrift für kritische Stadtforschung, as well as the speaker of the section Urban and Regional Sociology at German Sociology Association. Her research interests include citizenship and migration, political participation, neighborhood research, social networks, social capital, as well as sport and migration. Today, she's going to give a speech titled Spatial Dynamics in the Context of Refugee Receptions. Floor is yours. Like, okay, does this work? Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so um, I would like to talk a little bit um, today about space and power in the context of refugee reception and um, the, the guiding question of my talk is um, how is the spatial distribution um, of refugees managed and how does this affect their access to resources? And um, the conceptual lens I'm using is informed by border regime and citizenship studies and with a specific focus on international variations of such patterns. And based on different kinds of research projects um, on local conditions of refugee reception since 2015 to Germany, in Germany, and maybe to say this from the beginning, I focus rather on pe um, more or less on people who apply for asylum. So of course the category of refugees are, is much larger, but so that, that's the sum of the limit of my talk. Um, and for those that might not be so familiar with the German context, 2015 is such a, like, is, um, yeah, is somehow like a new phase of refugee and flight migration to Germany because, especially because of the numbers. Um, so as you see, this is the, um, this is, uh, these are asylum applications um, in Germany since the 20, uh, since the 1980s. And you see that uh, since 2014, 15, like the numbers rose really significantly. And since then also, like there are, are if you look at the uh, dec decades before, are at a pretty high level since. And also uh, Ukrainian refugees are not included because they usually do not apply for asylum. Um, but I will also like explicate a little bit later like tell um, say a little bit more about this later on. So why do I find citizenship um, and border regime studies very helpful to look at uh, reception context and especially like how on the factors that somehow like influence um, or governs um, a power and a space. So first of all, citizenship is generally understood to be or studied as um, uh, something that establishes an insider and outsider differentiation and that encompasses also different aspects. Um, normally it's understood to encompass a formal status, so for example your passport, um, specific rights attached to the status, um, so in a very common um, typology, civil, social and political rights, and I will focus especially on civil, civil and social rights in, the, um, in, in this talk, so civil rights are really like rights that um, encompass rights of individual freedom mostly. Um, and then there, what is also an important aspect are practices, um, of citizenship practices, because this is really about like, are you able to realize the formal rights you have, or maybe you're also able to realize some rights that you may not formally have. Um, and then also the, the aspect of identity often plays a major role. Um, uh, and so why in the context of immigration, um, it, this is interesting because different categories of immigrants are often included in some aspects of citizenship and not in others. Um, and this is what um, uh, Lydia Morris um, calls civic stratification and talks about like an increasing diversity of partial memberships. So most immigrants are somehow like included in some aspect of this and not in others. And it's not like you have one, some persons are excluded and others are included and have you one major medium category for some, um, for example, but like the ways that access to these rights and practices is stratified, is increasingly diversified. Um, so, and what I would like to add to this idea is that there's also local dimension and stratification of citizenship. So there's also internationally an uneven access to these dimensions of citizenship. So, um, and that is somehow like the starting point also that, that there is a civic and uh, spatial stratification to these uh, dimensions. 
And border regime studies do something somehow similar. So traditionally, they, they somehow depart from the geographical space of the border. Um, but um, especially border regime studies look also like on how state and, um, and non-state actors and also social practices produce borders and, for example, regulate migration. And that not only like on the nation-state border, but also um, um, that they um, look at borders at devices that regulate um, like yeah differential inclusion which is not necessarily fixed in one specific place but also multiplied in space it can be like internationally it can be supranationally and how they, these regulations affect people who are where is um, also very uh, can like they can be um, placed in very different um, localities for example so, and this um, really like um, then provides border as a concept, as an epistemological viewpoint to like look at these kinds of um, uh, hierarchizations, dominations, and but also like struggles around it and provides, I think like also very interrelational inter account of power, which is also very, sen or can be very sensitive to different constellations of actors and also different constellations of spatial relations. And in the first um, example I would like to give, that this is based um, on a paper I wrote in 2018 with Ulrike Hamann. Um, we looked at refugees' access to housing and residency in Germany. And we looked specifically on how this access is uh, governed by different um, local scales. So, um, and what we argued is that uh, the, the asylum application system in Germany is um, organized as a multi-level system of distribution uh, and restrictions, uh, or the, so it distributes people, but it also restricts their movement and settlements in specific ways. So, and what it then does is that it creates spatial and temporal border zones that Get manage how people who can access, for uh, for example, the freedom of movement, the freedom um, a freedom of settlement and housing. So um, and what's also and I will show um, in a minute uh, what this is about introduces is a tension between accessing civil and social rights. So what happens if you would come to Germany, um, you are in the territory, you apply for asylum, what, um, so you would register in a first step and then you would be uh, distributed about, um, along a mechanism that's called Königsberger Schlüssel, uh, which is something that is based on the tax income and the population size of the German Bundesländer, so the regional federal states in Germany. So. Um, this is somehow um, so that they, along these characteristics, uh, um, asylum applicants get distributed along Germany. Then you have to stay in an initial accommodation facility, which also includes a so-called Residenzpflicht, um, so which basically means you're not allowed to uh, leave the district or city where this accommodation facility is placed. This can lead to really absurd situations where people cannot go to the next bigger city, for example, which is just really like three train stations away, but um, would have to apply to go there. Um, so this is the first temporal internal border that is um, um, erected like in this initial phase of the asylum application. And this um, also, like for some people that apply for asylum, it takes longer to get out of this border. So for example, people from so-called safe uh, origin countries, um, they have to stay in these uh, facilities for the whole time of their asylum application. The others get further distributed to a municipality or district um, and then something comes in where like national law has an idea how this accommodation should work so um, should be a common accommodation but then federal member states have their own regulation and then municipality do something completely else sometimes so um, I would leave it at this right now but what is important is that the the type of housing and the type of accommodation you encounter when you get redistributed to a municipality or district like um, significantly differs between federal states and municipality and it's really hard to get a sense of what is happening only from the regulations um, so then um, also, like when people um, are in the accommodation, they have to stay there for a certain amount of time, um, and then um, after some time, this also varies um, over localities when they can enter the housing market. 
it, when you then have like acquired a protected status, um, uh, your freedom of settlement um, is still restricted. And this is a regulation that came into effect in 2016, the so-called Wohnsitzregelung, um, which restricts the freedom of settlement for another three years. It basically says that you have to take um, your residency in the federal state where your application procedure was processed. Um, and then federal states also have the possibility to introduce more detailed regulation. Either say you have to live in this municipality or you cannot move to this large city, for example. And the official goal is that um, to support uh, sustainable integration. Um, and I, yeah, so, and it also can be lifted. So when you have, for example, a job in a different state um, or you have, you need to attend educational training there. But what it does, so when we look at the different components of citizenship, so um, it restricts housing market and the right, the housing market access and the right of free settlement for refugees with a protected status when they receive social welfare. So what it, that it creates then a tension between access to civil and social rights. Um, and uh, so we could also call this a differential inclusion along time, location and economic position. So when you can, like how you, how you can decide how you would like to move and settle into different spatial locations. Then since, um, since 2021, um, since the war in Ukraine started, there's also a new, um, um, new refugee status, um, which came into effect in what is in German, I don't know the English term actually, um, EU Massenzustromrichtlinie, but it <laughs> so it, it basically, um, gives um, refugees from Ukraine um, immediate access to the labor market, immediate access to social welfare rights, um, and so for ex gives them a, sta a protected status for um, one or two years. Um, it also depends a little bit on the federal state how long the initial granting of this status is. Um, so there's first another like civic stratification among ca different categories of refugees along like their origin country. But then, if they also get distributed along the Königsteiner Schlüssel, if they are need in accommodation or social welfare, so there's also like a similar tension between civil and social rights, which is introduced here. So there are like again, I think this is not a clear hierarchy between refugees, but it's like a multifaceted, like very multi-dimensional, um, different kinds of hierarchizations that are take, that is taking place here. Um, so, and then, of course, just to mention it, uh, um, is that then, of course, if you want the housing market, enter the housing market in different localities, it really depends on how is the local housing market structured, um, are there further local policies to support or restrict your access, um, is there support by civil society or refugee networks, um, and, of course, like, what is, like, what are the, is there housing market discrimination, for example. So what I would like to, what I wanted to show here is that there is an internal multiplica multiplication and extension of the border in uneven ways along the scales of government, along the categorizations of refugees. Um, it um, has different temporal dimensions and also is also affected by local practices of the administration, civil society actors and refugees, for example. And you could say, okay, so what? <laughs> um, so, um, but this, of course, this also, of course, affects like how people are placed where. Um, also affects how they can access um, uh, resources locally, or if they maybe need to travel somewhere else. Um, and um, this is something um, uh, my colleague Leonie Kiskinkilic um, and I looked at in a recent paper on infrastructures in the context of arrival, multidimensional patterns of resource access um, in established in new immigrant neighborhoods in Germany. And there um, we looked at arrival really as a phase of first settlement and orientation um, and looked um, and used also like um, infrastructure literature to like look more on like uh, the social material characteristics of arrival. And something that we really found useful from this literature on infrastructure is also that um, the, how the role of social boundaries is highlighted there. Um, so um, this is uh, one a quote by Starr, a very classic one, one person's infrastructure is another one's topic or difficulty. And I think that uh, really sensitizes also for that 
arrival or infrastructures which are helpful for the arrival of some categories of refugees, for example, can not be that helpful for others, for example. And what we looked made like what we did in the paper is we looked at three dimensions um, of relevant infrastructures: housing, social infrastructures, and public space. And um, this stems from research uh, where we looked at four different neighborhoods that varied along their uh, along their um, population uh, composition in terms of um, socioeconomic and also migration related characteristics. I will look only here at two of these neighborhoods, Berlin Kreuzberg, where we are currently at, um, and Dresden Gorbitz, because they represent somehow very detrimental patterns of how they provide resources to um, to refugee populations. So Berlin Kreuzberg, as you as some of you might know, is a very diverse district. We also like we did not look at the whole district, only a part of it, but um, I think this. Um, this was part of it, right? So the place where we are at right now. So um, it's a it's a very diverse um, district. It has a lot of uh, different migration history. It has a local infrastructure of um, immigrant organizations and other social organizations that are very used to cater to uh, multilingual clients. Um, and um, Dresden Gorbitz, on the other hand, um, is a neighborhood where uh, migration was not that present before 2015, but in 2015, so it's a it's a high-rise neighborhood as at the periphery of Dresden. Um, so it was uh, uh, it was built during the GDR era, and um, but the but the city of Dresden housed a lot of refugees um, in 2015-16 uh, there in shared flats, and many people also due to housing vacancies were able to find their own private flat afterwards in the neighborhood. So <clears throat> what we see in Kreuzberg is like, so we talked to a lot of different actors on the, um, like so for example, for, uh, um, with local administration and politicians, but uh, mainly also uh, with refugees, and that's, um, we, I will draw on the interviews with refugees mostly here. So um, in Kreuzberg, uh, we talked to people who were living in two uh, common accommodation, which are in the, in the district. Um, but what, uh, and also to people which uh, who use the neighborhood. So because um, uh, most people really find it found it really difficult to find private housing um, due to high costs, really scarce availabilities, and also limited support um, that was available. Um, so this was something like that most people struggled with, even like the especially the people who are housed here in um, common accommodations. They would, they most of them said, well, we really would like to stay here, but that's not possible. So we really have to move out um, of the inner city. Then on the other hand, everyone, like almost everyone we talked to, really described the public space as really like welcoming. Um, like especially um, people from the Middle East said, "Well, um, I, I'm really able to blend in. I do not feel as as a newcomer here." But then also like black um, black refugees um, experience a lot of ra racist discrimination and especially feared encounters with the police. So here we really see that like this access to personal security is really structured along different categorization of, um, um, of refugees. Um, in terms of social infrastructure, most people also found that very accommodating, so that there's a net dense network with multilingual services, um, and this is also really something that like, um, was not only used by residents, but it's in this sense, Kreuzberg in terms of the public space and the social infrastructure was really a hub for many people coming because they knew that there is like there's legal counseling here that they could access um, and a lot of organizations with a lot of experience. And in Gorbitz, this was somehow the other way around. So as I said, housing, um, in terms of housing, there were more availabilities. People moved there because it was also cheap housing, which was like in the confines of what the social welfare office would, um, would allow uh, to pay or would pay. Um, and um, also, and what they said, well, I mean, that they like to move to the neighborhood because they have their private flat. So um, they were then really like independent to organize their daily lives. In terms of public space, on the other hand, um, almost everyone we talked to said, well, there are racist hostilities and threats um, that they encounter on a very da yeah, daily basis. And in terms of social infrastructures, most people said, well, yeah, it's available, but um, there are a lot of like um, link, um, 
language barriers and there is a lack of multilingual services. So we have here like somehow so uh, the situation that Kreuzberg is no access to housing but good um, good access to public space and social infrastructure and Gorbitz is the other way around. So what we see here is that there are different patterns or uh, to resources along the local variations and also that there is still or variation along social boundaries and categorizations and these also differ a little bit between these localities. So it's not um, something that's um, so that is something that's interacting with this. So to conclude, um, uh, I wanted to show that there um, that these international regulations of movement and settlement that um, restrict, for example, the um, the freedom of settlement um, create temporal internal border which are stratified uh, for different categories of migrant um, along the categorization of refugees along humanitarian worthiness. So, for example, so different categories of migrants which are usually, I think, not always um, introduced along um, the country of origin. Um, then that these regulations often include like a tension between the access of civil and social rights, um, uh, set so that there can be situations where, where you cannot have both. Um, and that this is further affected by other international regulations, local practices, local constellations of actors, um, for example, NGOs, refugee networks, housing market actors. And this then also and this, um, so establishes path dependencies uh, and affects resource access in terms of social support that you can access, economic welfare, um, job um, access. Um, so there's, for example, one study by um, Herbert Brücker um, that shows that there is um, that people who underlie this um, resident regulation um, have like a much slower labor market access uh, than others. Um, and these patterns of resource access are then also further differentiated along locality, available infrastructures and categorizations. And this, of course, affects arrival processes, but further on then also like social positions of people and um, their status and access to this, yeah, dimensions of social inequality, including social power further on. Um, yeah, thank you. Now it works, okay, a bit confusing. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the very interesting, enlightening talk. Um, if there is no immediate question, we will move to the second talk. I see not, okay. So uh, now we have um, Professor Johanna Herning. Um, we talked about this before, it was a little difficult to find information about you, but I did my best, let's see. Um, so, um, Professor Herning is a professor of sociology and urban planning and has actually recently um, uh, been, have the position in TU Berlin sociology department. Congratulations on the new position. Um, previously, she studied um, sociology, economics and Romanistic, which is translated as Roman studies, I, I'm not sure, at the University of Passau and Goethe um, University in Frankfurt. Um, she completed her dissertation at Goethe University with the title The Megacity as Concept and Reality on the Spatial Political Planning and Social Configuration of Large Cities using Brazil as an example. She was a research assistant in various fields in the Institute of Sociology at TU Berlin. From 2019 to 2021, she held a visiting professorship in social inequality, politics and space at TU Berlin and was also leading the project non-governmental organizations, strategies of spatial order formation in the first phase of CRC. Um, and she is also our associate member she has been an adjunct professor, uh, lecturer at various universities, and among others, she is a member of the editorial board of Suburban. Um, she teaches sociology with a special focus on urban and spatial sociology. She has been working on the Brazilian cities for many years, 
Um, in her academic work, she focuses on relationship between general societal dynamics and the spatial and political premises, prom, uh, processes with a particular interest in cities and civil society actors. Today, she's going to uh, give a speech with the title Struggling for Land, Places and Spaces of Power, Dominance and Contestation, or something like this. Um, so, yeah, floor is yours. Hello, hello. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much for this kind introduction. Thank you for the invitation. But probably mostly thank you all for being here. Um, yes, uh, I'm very sorry for those uh, difficulties. Uh, it's just because the process of moving somewhere institutionally is kind of uh, a long process. And um, the website is going to work very soon. <laughs> so I'm uh, looking forward to this evening, to the discussions with you. I'm looking forward to seeing what comes from, you know, kind of uh, joining our thoughts together and discussing them. Um, I'm also very happy to be here and to be able to be part of this wonderful program that you've set, um, uh, set up here. Before I start, though, I have to bring you a, an, uh, an apology from Hubert Knobloch, who specifically wrote me an email to say, he, and he, I did see him today at TU Berlin, he did not seem well. Um, he's, um, he's sick and he couldn't be here tonight, so, and he apologized for that because he really wanted to be here. So when I was preparing for this keynote, for a part of this keynote, I thought to myself that you will be dealing with some you know, empirical and political and uh, um, uh, yeah, practical questions, so I might as well take the um, chance to share with you some uh, conceptual thoughts, which I'm going to do now in a rather old-fashioned way because I don't have uh, PowerPoint slides. I'm just going to talk to you and hope, uh, I've tried to boil it down and I hope you'll, you'll um, bear with me. <laughs> now, uh, to begin with, I dare say that as an urban and spatial sociologist, if I might say, um, all my research evolves around the question, or rather interrelation, of power and space. And I also dare say that this is a necessity rather than a coincidence. Why is that the case? Well, I'm sure that after your reading session this afternoon, uh, or um, the answer or even the thought itself might not be, seem so surprising to you. As space is produced socially, it is produced within social structures of inequality, of institutionalized ways of in and exclusion, and thus of struggles about the very same as we've just seen uh, in the example of refugee um, uh, distribution and allocation. I will continue now in four steps. Um, first, I want to outline um, what, I'm, what it means to pursue a um, political sociology of space. Second, I want to discuss the role of contestation and develop the notion of politics of space. And third, I want to show what this helps us to see when comparing struggles for housing and land uh, in urban and rural settings, which I'm bringing the example of Brazil. <laughs> from my own research, and fourth, I will sum up very briefly with the thesis that what we need to have in mind is actually both power and domination when analyzing the relationship between the social and the spatial. Now, uh, to some foundational thoughts of a political sociology of space. Um, I think that a political sociology of space sharpens our view of space as something that is not simply socially produced, but, and that is intrinsically related to that social production, it is also negotiated between actors. Social norms and values, the relations between social groups, they're not only expressed through space, but they are also negotiated, contested, confirmed through space. Think of, um, we're in Berlin, think of the annual disputes um, about whether barbecues should be allowed in Volkspark Friedrichshain social gatherings, with music and everything else that comes about with it, uh, if they should be permitted, or whether the park should not rather be a quiet place of greenery. So this is kind of, you know, these contestations and these uh, discussions and disputes among, about um, specific places occur a lot. An example of such negotiations can also be the question of whether the allotment garden, garden settlement has to make way for social housing or should the new accommodations for refugees be built in Hohenschönhausen or in Steglitz. Places and spaces um, are relevant to different actors in many different ways. An urban wasteland in the middle of Berlin is to some a place of indeterminate possibilities and a promise of a different life. 
Um, for others, it is an investment promise, of course, and for others still, it is a sign of disorder and neglect in the city. So what I want to say is that um, spaces are a foundation and a resource for social relations, just as much as they are the result of social negotiations. Sociality and materiality of spaces thus interact and form a, what in the CRC, most refer to as a proce processual figuration. <laughs> <laughs> it is not surprising from the sociology of space, but no less shocking for that, actually, um, how much the crises of our time show this. The war in Ukraine makes it dramatically clear how contested the borders of the territorial are. Disputes about f um, flight and asylum show again and again that the question of which body, <laughs> which bodies are where is uh, socially very important, and also that border locations such as a Greek island uh, can simultaneously symbolize and call into question um, the idea of Europe. And the COVID-19 pandemic, or the socio-political handling of it, might, we might say, has vehemently shown us the ambivalences of our material existence between global interconnectedness, territorial closure, um, and local specificity. A uh, former colleague uh, at here at CRC, Gunther Weidenhaus, has shown us that the relationship between space and time is an intrinsic aspect of subjectivity and of the way individuals relate to the world. But not only individual subjectivity, also the self-identification of collective actors such as states, companies, social movements, and more or less intentional social groups um, relate, uh, is related to space. Such collectivities cannot only be understood by their weak or strong ties, the imagined community, their role differentiations and structures, and their social structural commonalities, the power and decisive structures, uh, the division of tasks and labors, but they also position themselves in the world. They delimit, they separate, and define themselves in relation to others or to an one another spatially. They occupy a square, for example, as a symbolic place of social participation, or they define themselves through territorial sovereignty or they simply assume a certain spatial scope or reach of their actions. Space, um, in a Lefebvrean understanding, uh, is socially produced through three closely interconnected dimensions. I'm just really gonna rush to, through this because I'm sure you're all familiar with this. Definitely, space has a material side that we can perceive. This material side usually tempts to think of space as given and detached from social action as its background foil. But first, this materiality acquires meaning only through social practice. This is the symbolic dimension. And I recall, like in this case, the multiple meanings of the urban wasteland that I just mentioned. And secondly, this materiality does not come by chance. It is planned, it is conceived, it's regulated, etc. That is the conceptual side of spaces. The buildings, the streets, the routes, the flight lines, the border fences, and even the forest itself, uh, they are not simply there, but they are purposefully designed. And so the question can always be asked, who can determine how the spatial arrangements are designed and for what benefit and goal? So accordingly, a political sociology of space allows us to look at how the relationship between these three spatial dimensions is negotiated by different actors. These negotiations are what I call politics of space. And this results in specific meanings and uses of spaces which can be in agreement or in conflict with normative meanings and uses. So I'm almost there, generally defining what the politics of space are, but we need one more step, which I'm going to do very quick because it's related to something that you're discussing in the CRC a lot. Um, we need to ask the question, what are those specific meanings and the spaces themselves? So if you're familiar with the CRC, the spatial concepts, then this will come as, as a surprise to you, because in the literature on social theory of space, there are usually three logics identified in the way the relationship between sociality and materiality can be organized, namely in terms of places, territories, and networks. Within the CRC, the notion of the trajectorial space has been introduced to this triad so that we can speak of four different spatial figures altogether. Now, places and territories both refer to identifiable and spatially more or less visible entities. Trajectories and networks, on the other hand, are two types of spatial connectivity or connection logics. So what a, spatial, a political sociology of space looks at um, at the politics of space through, is um, 
through which actors negotiate spaces and try to enforce certain meanings and uses of the same. But what happens in politics with the space? Or put another way, when is an action uh, socio-political or spatio-political, let's say? So when I look into what I understand as politics of space, the first answer that I've already given you was, we can speak of politics of space when actors negotiate the relationship between those three dimensions, the symbolic, the conceived, and the material dimension of spaces. Take, for example, the negotiations on the banks of the Spree in the east, uh, eastern parts of Berlin and the conflict of how they are to be planned, how they are to be designed, used, and what their meaning should be. Should they rather be private and economic uh, or communal, public, and sociocultural within the Berlin urban development? This is a very uh, banal or blunt or very um, common example for those negotiations. But the second answer was, we are dealing with politics of space when actors negotiate the logic of place, territory, network, and uh, trajectory of spaces. Let me give you an example here, too. And it comes from my own neighborhood, where every week an entire street is closed for a few hours due to the actions of a local initiative. The rest of the week, the street uh, is at the service of its connecting service. <laughs> the street, it's, it's intended for traffic, of course. It's a, a pathway. Let's say. During these hours, however, it becomes a place where the neighborhood can meet, children can play in the street, and much more. So these kind of negotiations where the logic and the, the, the logic of organization of um, a, a, um, a societal space is uh, altered, differed, uh, contested, negotiated, this is part of what I um, perceive as politics of space. So they, the politics of space are always about changing or stabilizing social spaces, and thus the relationship between sociality and materiality. So I'm coming to the question of how contestations of space um, and the struggles for housing and land can actually be seen from this perspective. Um, so housing and land are obviously spatial manifestations of highly relevant aspects of social life. They are related to the ways um, and the whereabouts of our material sustenance of life. They are highly capitalized nowadays, and thus access to both is severely exclusionary for a shockingly high number of people worldwide, as we all know. Um, the general speciality is easy to see. Housing and land both have a material side, of course, because we live in buildings uh, that are arranged spatially and that are surrounded by built infrastructure and resource um, uh, infrastructure and land is perceivable, divisible, usable materiality and resource in social practice. Both are severely regulated through the social institution of property. The spatial arrangements formed by housing and land are not coincidental. They are being planned, regulated, organized, maintained, altered, destructed, supplemented, among many other things. Why certain decisions are being made? If we, if we feel at ease, at home, within these arrangements, all that has a lot to do with the meanings ascribed to housing in general and to specific forms of housing, but also for land. But of course, these meanings, they are not the same for different actors and social groups. Housing and land are perceived for some as commodities, for others as sustenance of life, um, others perceive them as a universal right, to name the most salient ones that are intention uh, in, a, in, a, in, you know, kind of interrelated and form attention. I mentioned earlier that I would like to speak to you about the differences between urban and rural spaces and the contestation practices referring to housing and land. Building up on um, and, but extending Ananya Roy's understanding, I conceptualize the urban and the rural as political spaces in which specific regulations and logics of territory, of place, and property are determined, put forward, and contested. This is very important to me, I think. We need to think um, about um, the urban and the rural as political spaces um, where we have like specific regulations of territory, land, um, territory place, and property. One of the most striking examples to me of the interrelations but also differences between the politics of urban and rural spaces is the case of the Brazilian socio-territorial movements. It is a context where historically developed structures of inequality relate to the distribution of land and property so thoroughly, but they also have been marked by intense struggles and highly visible social movements like um, the MST is the uh, landless movement. 
Both the urban reform and the agrarian reform relate to struggles in politics on every possible level, from the streets and occupation sites to federal councils and ministries. They turn the lives of many into struggle for survival under severe conditions of inequality and exclusion. But not only the processes of reform politics, also the dynamics and consequences of local struggles seem to point towards divergences between the urban and the rural spatial context. Even though many big latifundia are kept unproductive and therefore are not in accordance with the federal constitution, federal law, policies have been very conservative and protective of existing power relations. Current developments suggest an even higher concentration of land and a further accentuated asymmetry in recent years. Industrialization and green grabbing in the rural context are crucial for this. Small farmers are forced into contract farming, taking away their control over the land that still remains formally as their property, as well as over their own labor. It is through what violence that the Brazilian elites really have secured control over land, territory, and property, not only evicting and displacing, but also killing farmers and rural activists. Every year, the Comissão Pastoral da Terra registers assassinations of rural activists and, con and in conflict situations over rural land, and it is a sad fact, actually, that the number of these have not only risen constantly since the 1980s, but have been accentuated during the government of Bolsonaro. It is important, I think, thus, to understand this context through a politically and economically stabilized system of domination, um, a domination that shapes rural spaces in highly exclusionary ways. If social movements like the landless movement want to contest them, contest them, they have to reside to territorial structures in order to maintain any kind of security. That way, only collective occupations of land drawing territorial boundaries have a chance to stand. And I think um, the territorial, the domination part of territorial um, um, logic is also very clearly in, in what uh, Nihat has shown before. Now, let's have a quick look at the urban scenario in comparison. Some 10 to 15 years ago, discussions of urban struggles used to be quite enthusiastic, considering achievements and transformations towards a more equal society. There were significant and major landmarks, notably the creation of a Ministry of Urban Affairs and the enactment of the Statute of the City, um, claiming more participatory urban politics. Today, urban politics are seen as caught in a deadlock, though. Uh, and urban developments are analyzed as ever more deeply bound by capitalist developments and financialization, as in many other places, both in the centers and in the peripheries. Still, recent years have also seen the emergence of new forms of contestation and social movements. These developments have extended the spectrum and range of urban struggles significantly, connecting not only different groups from different cities in a broad network, but also leading to class transcending action. This is related to the mega events of the Football World Cup, for example, and the Olympic Games uh, in 2016, uh, which led to a new wave of expulsions in order to realize large urban development projects. Um, and the overall perspective is consistent with the key notion of the right to the city, the struggle for the right to partake in the wealth a society produces and concentrates in urban agglomerations, and for an urban space that is inherently democratic in a pluralistic understanding or pluralist understanding. Now what happens in the urban scenario is that you do need territorial strategies too, but because of the specific nature of urban space, allowing for a greater multitude of difference and its negotiation through places, gatherings, demonstrations, networks, etc., spatial contestations are bound to power relations and allow for their negotiations. The severe context of rural domination reduces political practice in the spatial negotiations quite literally, while the urban context, context fu functions as a facilitator of political contestation and negotiation, facing not so different power asymmetries in terms of the economic and political regulation of land, housing, and property, um, but um, managing to kind of create an, um, a situation of, I mean, power is also related to empowerment and the contestation of it, whereas domination is the limitation, actually, of political practice. So summing up, um, coming to a very brief uh, conclusionary remark, I really want to lead your attention not only to the general aspect of power, 
uh, which not only limits but also enables conflict, but more specifically to the difference between power and domination and the political spaces that may or may not go along with both. I think we ought to question in how far the specific spatial figures, territory, place, network, territory, uh, relate to structures of power and domination and how spaces are produced and reproduced, claimed and contested within both. And I'm very happy that Nihad uh, presented uh, what she was on refugee um, um, accommodation because we can see it clearly there too and not only in the Brazilian example. So thank you for uh, listening in and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you both for um, very interesting, enlightening talks. I think it's also um, quite nicely related. I'm also looking forward to discuss between the connections and so on. Um, and sorry for my coughing. I did corona test. I'm not. I just like it's somehow stuck. So I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't get panicked. Um, so now we are getting uh, questions from public um, here, but also online. Um, anyone? So we're going to do round three, four questions, and then um, our guests will have chance to answer the questions. Is there anyone who wants to ask the first question? Very exciting. Of course not. That's always the most difficult. <laughs> okay, I ask the first questions then. <laughs> Uh, I actually have a question for both of you, and I think somehow they're related. Mm, from your talk, um, may I say, Nihad? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I kind of, I think everyone who comes to Germany from abroad has this experience of like super complicated structures, bureaucracies, and don't know what to do with it. And especially this idea that there are like different levels, right? Like you have the regional level, you have the city, local, national, international, and so on. And there's always like this tension between these different, um, different levels. And that might be a stupid question, but I really cannot understand how something that's so obviously, you know, contradicting, like how, how this is still in place and do you see any logic, any reason for why this like different levels and the contradictions between le different levels is not being solved? Do you see any like strategic reasons for this? Like, I, I don't know. I, I think it's also I'm reflecting on my own experience. I, I have to admit I'm not like an expert on the history of federalism in Germany, but I think like I think to some extent it's inherent to um, to the organization of nation states everywhere, right? I mean you always and I think also like um, connects to what uh, Johanna said and also um, on like the different concepts we use because like if for example like um, connections between um, space and power or how regulations are done are interrelational then you always have contradictory things going on like if there are actors with different interests I mean there's not the homogenous state actor there are already like different actors in like uh, one government that try to find like one course of action right so and then of course I think every like every political system has their characteristics of how important for example municipal um, municipal levels are or federal states or membership um, levels are um, and so there are differences of course in how nation states are organized um, but I think these contradictions are always present and um, especially um, between of course the national level and other levels of government um, but also if you then introduce also or take it seriously that other people like NGOs or people themselves or like um, resistance are, um, do also play a major role then this is of course a huge entryway for contradictions. <laughs> It's also a good thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I see the, the good part, but somehow it's um, maybe we expect too much logic from the state. You know, it's, <laughs> it's not very logical. <laughs> uh, Johanna, my question for you is um, actually about like, because you're talking about different, um, different struggles, different movements, right? Like the rural and the urban and different actors involved in this. 
Um, we are also like somehow working on this like indigenous movements and um, ecological movements in Brazil. And I want to ask you about like um, when you are presenting different spatial logics. One is also network, but you can also think of networks of like activism uh, in different spaces and so on. Um, how do you see like the, the the connections because there are different logics right in urban activism and rural activism and indigenous activism do you see tensions or like potential solidarities like how is the situation actually uh but also like maybe some theoretical abstractions i don't know <laughs> i'll try and do my best um so, yeah, naturally, social movements form uh, generally a very, so are involved in many network building activities. And there are some who are more locally bound um, and others who work a lot. For example, I mean, I was talking about the territorial domination concerning the landless movement. And of course, the landless movement is one of the most internationally uh, um, networking <laughs> movement um, so far and very visible in that way also. Um, that is a way of internal movement organization and building up solidarity and also, in, I mean, encouraging also activism. I think this plays a, a major role also. But it does not really alter the position of the local activists when they struggle for access to land in the Brazilian hinterland. This is just simply, it is, it is a, a very harsh truth that they are just confronted with severe um, power symmetries and a system of domination that, is, that, that, that pushes them also only to a, a, merely to a territorial logic. Um, so I do think that this is there's kind of a, there's a there's a it is it is not the same and building up networks uh, organizational networks does not interfere naturally or just you know kind of automatically with your situation um, that you struggle for. Then there's um, many others and I think we have to differentiate between. Um, so there's a Brazilian geographer who uh, dis, uh, dif differentiates between socio-territorial and socio-spatial movements in Brazil. I, 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 I think this is a kind of a, it's, it's tricky because there's also so many um, other movements that at times um, fight over a land and concrete spaces and places. So um, you can't say that a movement is just simply non-territorial and the others are territorial. But it helps in understanding that the logic and the the relation to land, property, and uh, land uh, and property, uh, land housing and property, um, is something that um, builds up a uh, is kind of like a, a setting in which um, a um, you're kind of bound to local structures uh, and and power symmetries. So when you're in the urban setting. There is, of course, I, a greater diversity. I mean, the the federal framing is the same. The legislation is not the same, but it is uh, similar to uh, at least the federal uh, relation in relation to the federal law. Um, and certain things are the same, but the setting is a different one. And it uh, is, of course, uh, a setting. I don't want to say the urban context is so wonderful and empowering and uh, differentiated and, and there's so much political activity possible. But it is though at times and it just is a different setting for political ac action. And I think we have to take that in account, into account and um, consider that there are different power asymmetries and relations and that they, they lead to different spatial uh, political, spatial political practices. Okay, we have a question. <laughs> I want to, I want to, yeah, dwell on, on this uh, aspect, which is a very interesting um, argument that there are certain 
the type of space, the rural and the urban, is kind of forcing a certain way of contestation. What is maybe, as I understood the argument, that the rural situation is forcing toward the territorial logic of contestation. So, but what exactly then is doing this forcing? So is this a space? Because I can also imagine that you can contest, con put a contestation in the rural of networked aspects. I mean, they need to uh, get resources in and out. And so can't you just contest this network aspect of space? So why are you constrained to the territorial logic? And so very interesting aspect of the power of space, but who is enforcing this power, or what, or, or what kind of power is this? Thanks, thanks, Henning. Um, very important, because um, I would say that the urban and the rural are political spaces, but um, what forces or enforces or determines or pushes towards something is not the space per se. But the regulation of the space and the um, and the social relations um, power asymmetries um, and in term, in, con in the context of the rural um, access to land um, is bound to very um, harsh system of domination and that is um, relevant for um, you know so if you're faced with a system of domination that harsh and rigid. Um, then you are forced to um, kind of push towards, you, you only have those territorial, <laughs> the territorial logic because you have to find like a safe harbor, you have to build a, um, um, borders, you know? So there's border building from, from many sides and sometimes they can uh, just function as a way of um, securing um, a collective. And I mean, this is, the notion is the same for, <laughs> for the state maybe, but um, the way that it works is very different. And I think you have the same aspect in the urban setting too. So if you have an occupation in the urban setting, the same happens. You have to secure uh, and then um, a building becomes a territory because you have to kind of really, you have to, um, you have to secure it like a territory. Um, uh, creating homogeneity inwardly and heterogeneity outwardly. That is what a territory is about. And um, so this logic is different. And so I think it just, it's not the space, the urban or the rural space that does that, but it's the power relations and asymmetries and social uh, relations of inequality in an exclusion that um, 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 enforce or determine or ask for certain spatial, spatial political strategies. Thank you. This is also a question for Johanna. Um, you about how how you conceptualize uh, power and domination, and I was wondering whether um, you know being in charge, having the power, like <laughs> would you say then it's uh, the the exercising of this power is uh, equals domination, or would you rather conceptualize it as a very harsh form of exercising this power? Maybe you can elaborate on these two terms a bit. Thank you. Yeah, so <laughs> those are kind of very, very foundational concepts um, for many disciplines, actually. Um, but I'm coming from sociology, so I'm going to give you like a kind of a, a, a sociological idea about it. Basically, I mean, power is, is usually thought of as um, being able to make others do what you want them to do <laughs> or not. Um, so it's a kind of exerting power of others, but it has, it's always a social relation because I don't have power because I just take it. Um, it has to be um, given or ascribed or um, uh, legitimized or whatever. So it's always a relationship. The same applies to domination, but domination is a structural form within which um, like there's a kind of uh, institutionalized and um, fixated um, uh, structure of uh, power asymmetry. And I think the main idea, what I think is important about it is that um, within a power relation, um, the questioning of the power relation is, uh, a, you're able to question it. Within a relationship of dominance or domination, um, the intention is to not question it 
to um, be subjected to it completely. So there is a there is a difference uh, in in um, empowerment and possibility of engage. It's, uh, there's some who say domination is the absence of the political. That's Hannah Arendt, for example. So it's the, the absence of the political because it's actually a situation, a non-political situation, because it's just subjects um, uh, others to to a certain um, sense and logic of being. If not, I have a question for Nihat. Um, so you were talking about this differential, differential inclusion, right? Um, so it has different di dimensions that there's differential inclusions for different groups also. Um, and what I'm wondering is like, what does this do to internal relations within the refugee communities, like in a space like Kreuzberg, where you have like very different groups, ethnic groups, um, different backgrounds uh, and so on, and um, whether this like differential inclusion rights and so on creates tension or there, are there ways in which um, refugee communities and even maybe more generally migrant communities find to kind of remain in solidarity, so, yeah. I think we, we find both, right? So, um, I, um, yes, a lot of times, like, um, I think some of the discourses or narrations around uh, refugee reception since 2015 also had, like, um, um, provoked like feelings of envy from previous migrant populations, for example, especially like people from uh, Lebanon or uh, Palestine that said, well, I mean, we had to live like under like very uh, difficult status for such a long time. And now like, so I mean, this is at least, this is not something someone told us directly, but something, I mean, there are some newspaper reports and then some like some people from social organizations will tell you this. Um, so, and of course now, right now, the situation is also something that, um, like, so I, we recently um, were at field work in some of the, in one of the city where um, we do our research. And so there, um, there was a lot of talk in the organization where we at um, for one day where like people talked a lot about the differentiation between uh, Ukrainian refugees and other refugees, and then also um, among, like um, then other like boundaries were really prevalent um, um, in the confrontation to like um, Germans without a migration background but with like poor resources. So who? So it's really like so. And this is of course um, I think. Um, this is maybe from a solidarity <laughs> standpoint really frustrating, but I think it's really like also the political situation where we're at. So, and I think um, these are um, maybe the, I mean, the wrong distribution fights or conflicts um, from like a more, um, uh, yeah, uh, from not maybe not, not an everyday uh, view on it, but like a more distributional view, like in the, um, in the whole like, German society, for example, or European, um, but um, this is often like what is, are like the everyday negotiations among people. Um, this is of course maybe not true everywhere and for everyone, but it's something that happens. Um, I think it's really, really difficult to say how prevalent it is and how um, mobilizable it is for different uh, movements. Um, uh, because I think so, and I would also be very a little bit cautious because, for example, we did one survey in like an East um, German neighborhood where, um, of course, to talk about this neighborhood is like everyone is racist there, right? So, and I mean, it is true that there is a high prevalence of, um, of racist attitudes. But there is still like a significant portion of the population that do not have like a closed um, 
racist worldview. And I think what comes out of view is if we um, just think about, oh, the majority or 40% or whatever, then we lose sight of maybe the 30 or 40 other percent that would still be like, um, that we would still be like maybe able to, um, yeah, for example, um, convinced to have more solidarity practice or for example many people say well this was some at some point this was like a very age mixed neighborhood and somehow this now comes back through migration so there I think there there are things where you could attach to and people are doing it also like on a very like everyday and personal basis um, but it's very mixed and it's, I think uh, I think that's the question right and so many relations right now is what is it that like drives people to one or this to this or this side because there is no like clear cut e easy answer to this yeah very kind of difficult thing to answer or no but uh, i guess it's also quite important <laughs> we all struggle with this uh any more questions also online uh okay then we have two questions and then we will give the floor to you. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, picking up this discussion um, about uh, internal contradictions in between different groups of dwellers in the city. Um, I would be interested in um, the role of the um, professional managerial class in, in the city. Um, I find this interesting because I think this is a group that is um, not as much under criticism as um, yeah, some racist dwellers of some Eastern German city, but um, whose behavior, uh, whose yeah, behaviors are excluding other people um, in a different way and um, maybe to just give one example, um, you mentioned this um, example from the street that is f like for one day in a week uh, open um, for everyone and the cars are not allowed to drive there. I have the impression that uh, those spaces in the city that um, have this nice infrastructure um, like the Bergmann Keats and uh, so on, um, I also like it to be there and have a coffee there. But um, at the same time, these are the places with um, the highest uh, gentrification pressure and um, the people who are dwelling there would uh, probably not consider themselves as um, discriminating against anyone. They would consider themselves to be like um, very progressive people, but at the same time, it's true that they will be um, given the flats there uh, and um, not um, some Syrian refugee. So I would be interested in your thoughts about this. Really important point um, because so um, and maybe also like one of the neighborhoods we looked at in this four case comparison was Hamburg Eppendorf um, and like in the beginning we as we selected this neighborhood in the beginning and then there was like it was there was supposed to be like a refugee um, accommodation built like it should be built there and it never like during our research phase it did not happen so it happened afterwards but like. So, and we were a little bit like in the beginning, we was like, oh no, we don't have anything to research. But in the end, it was a, like a really important case because as you said, like there are like other much more abstract mechanisms at play, how um, these, um, how these places can restrict um, refugee accommodation, for example, or other uses or housing by other poor populations, right? Because like, so people there were like in the majority really open. There was like a small kind of the population that was um, very, very highly like active against like restricting um, this accommodation or preventing it to be built. And I think like what what and then there's the question. So people are so open there, right? So what's what's the problem? But in the end. Um, there's, there's of course a huge difference if we, a difference if we um, compare like the attitude rates um, of this neighborhood to the, the to the population, for example, in Dresden Gorbitz, because, of course, also the people that say, well, I would welcome a uh, refugee accommodation here, know that the 
the housing prices are so high, this neighborhood will not change. So, I mean, that, that is like a more welcoming attitude, a more cosmopolitan attitude at a much lower price, right? Because they don't have to really to engage with the idea of this neighborhood changes. Um, I think that's something that, um, well, thus it cons it's very conservative in the way the space is organized. Um, it is not subject to change. And for example, like in the in Gorbets, like we had like this really high um, um, like rejective attitudes toward refugees, but there was no social initiative. There were no connections to the city government. And in like the more middle, like in Eppendorf, and we had another more upper middle class neighborhood in the case selection. There was, and I would say, really like maybe also like an entrepreneurial class in the other neighborhood um, um, that had very good connections to like the administration and the politicians um, that, uh, and they of course have the access. So it's it's definitely a, like a huge issue of economic and political inequality, and those are really strongly interrelated. Yes, thanks. I think I can only add uh, that I think that you've shown that quite um, quite clearly, you know, that the places that I actually, that would allow for, um, that have a bitter, um, you know, kind of a, an institutional um, framing, like, uh, um, and the infrastructures are just there, and it is a dense uh, place where there's already kind of a, 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 an environment that looks towards uh, difference and, uh, and, uh, and uh, heterogeneity, those places are simply not accessible. And um, I think this is a huge problem, but you've shown that really, this is what your research shows, right? That um, what I thought is that this kind of, this is a, when you said something about spatial stratification, um, this is probably, I was thinking um, all, the, all the time, all this time, about this notion of spatial stratification. I think it's quite interesting to see exactly this uh, in terms of spatial stratification. Because, you know, when we think about space, we usually think about a space, you know, a distribution that is, it needs to be horizontal most of the times at least, <laughs> and the stratification is kind of vertical. Um, but this works actually in this in the sense that um, those places um, are not accessible and so you do have that spatial stratification, yeah. Okay. I don't know if this is a question, I'm a little lost. So I, I'm thinking about uh, Nia talking about the role of social boundaries that one person's infrastructure is another person's difficulty and I'm thinking about power and domination and <clears throat> I'm thinking about the housing first rights movement which is a so-called empowering movement for people looking for housing but what about people preferring to be on the street for example uh, example from my own work for example who are not looking for that housing but find social relations where they are on the street so while so this is an elephant in the room because so-called empowering movements cannot be questioned. So you know, in what kind of theoretical and argumentative framework do we bring that in? Because questioning the state is increasingly easier than questioning the do-gooders. So where do we place them in this conversation? Hello, hello. So I think this is a very important point, um, but I also think that it is the thing about housing first and um, or the contestation of the notion of housing first actually more specifically is important because it relates to um, social norms and values and not only to a political regulation of such. It's both. And um, in terms of housing, uh, it's always the idea that, um, you know, access to housing as a social right, a universal right, actually. So it kind of, there's this whole, you know, um, understanding of it as, a, as an important figure in social and individual life, you know? Um, so I think that um, movements that look towards different forms of, um, um, spatial or physical and spatial sustenance of their social life 
um, face um, many bear, uh, boundaries and borders and in many ways, and not only those of spatial, um, um, statal regulation. So what I think here is um, that what you probably get is that, and also because this usually happens in the urban setting, um, where it is uh, very difficult, for example, for a person um, to create some kind of, let's say, territorial security um, if she or he does not have like a building or a fence or something like that. So it's kind of, there's so many questions that come up with that that I think can be addressed really, um, you know, can, can show really um, very, um, you know, kind of rubbing it actually in, 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 you know, because it's so difficult, it's so difficult to grasp that, but it's also a very severe um, um, situation where I think, but it doesn't speak to the housing situation as such, because why? Because if I speak about domination and power asymmetries and so forth with uh, social and um, urban movements and rural movements, this is, it is a, a state, is a fact. It doesn't change that. The, what it changes is or what we are able to see is that um, movements that are about um, other social values have it even even more diff it's more difficult even because they face um, uh, you know kind of social um, values and norms that are different and and so they're othered in that perspective too not only from the state regulation side. At the end, wow. <laughs> This microphone is not doing what I want. Um, is, is there any other question? Otherwise, I think we can finish and go to Zutblog and continue our conversation over drink. Um, for final remarks, I want to ask the organizing team again, do you, have, do you want to finish this, uh, this talk? I feel like you put a lot of work in it. The last word should be yours. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to force. Yeah, thank you so much, both of you. I think um, from this, both of these talks, I take away that like not only that the space is important, as we like to say in CRC, but it's also very much entrenched in social relations, inequalities, power, and domination and academically but also like living in in a city like berlin where like um urban life housing um everything is like a constant struggle and there are activists that are working on these issues who will all, we will also have chance to talk to um it's really important to remind ourselves and to each other how these questions of power and domination are important and entrenched in um, socia sociality, but also space. So thank you so much for this really interesting, really informative and uh, provoking talks. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you so much for being here um, and for interesting questions and contributions. So yeah, did I forget anything organizational? Let's see. No, just uh, we go to Zitblog. Okay. <laughs>